Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Vikar Mosin. Uh, in this talk, Summer and I are gonna be talking about exposing the right kind of APIs at various points in a P4 defined uh, SDN stack. So let's jump right into that. Um, so um, P4 uh, offers a formal contract between a controller and a switch. Um, I think uh, it is clear at this time that the controller's logical view of the forwarding pipeline uh, can be implemented by the switch. And a big win uh, for this is the ability to uh, get silicon independence as well as vendor independence as was previously talked. We just heard about the uh, proposed P4 runtime uh, switch interface, which allows the controller to manage P4 table entries at runtime. Uh, what we want to highlight here is that the P4 API, uh, sorry, the P4 runtime API uh, is uh, program independent. And by that, what we mean is that the message definitions and RPCs that make up the API do not change if the P4 program changes. Now, this is appealing for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it provides a stable API for easier vendor adoption. Uh, and second, it allows you to push new P4 programs to switches that are already deployed in the field without needing to recompile them. In this slide, uh, we show the workflow associated with the P4 uh, runtime, uh, sorry, P4 runtime API. Uh, so you begin with a switch spec expressed as switch.p4. We run that through the P4C compiler. Uh, this generates what we're calling here P4 info, which is a piece of data that captures target independent P4 program attributes, such as tables, uh, match fields, actions, parameters, and also assigns unique uh, integer IDs to them. Um, this P4 info is then made available to the controller front end. Um, it is also pushed to the switch as part of the P4 target config. And as a result, the proto messages that flow over the P4 runtime interface uh, are program independent because they only refer to P4 entities by, by these integer IDs. So let's take a look at an example. So on the left here is a P4 program snippet showing a VRF classifier implementation, uh, fairly standard stuff. On the right is the P4 info that would be generated by the P4C compiler. And what you see here is all the attributes of the P4 program on the left with uh, IDs generated for various fields uh, as well as other metadata such as the match type. And what we do next in our P4 runtime messages is to use this information. And so let's jump right into that. So again, you've got your uh, VRF uh, P4 snippet on the left. On the right is an actual instance of a P4 runtime message that would be communicated between the controller and the switch. In this example, this would be how a table entry, a materialized table entry would look like as it's being programmed on the uh, P4 switch. Um, so the, the main point here to notice is that the uh, IDs uh, that are used here are the ones that, are, that were generated by the compiler and captured in the P4 info, so we, we go ahead and use them here. And uh, as a result of this architecture, the API itself is stable. In other words, if I went ahead and changed the program on the left, the, 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 the schema and the format of the protocol will not change it's only the IDs and the values that would change. So you end up with an, with an API that the switch is exposing that is very stable. So this is all good, uh, but what about the API that we would like to expose to SDN apps? So I'm showing a world here where you got the switch at the bottom, you got the controller front end in the middle, and then the SDN apps on the top. So together, the SDN apps and the controller front end is usually what we refer to as the SDN controller. So we. We've discussed that having a PI, API between the front end and the switch is, is nice, has nice properties, but what about the API that we want to expose to the SDN apps? So um, we've realized that uh, the PI API is probably not the best fit for direct use by SDN apps. There are some concerns around uh, readability, type safety, and versioning, and I'll highlight some of those and then see what we can do about those. So, um, 
The first thing to highlight here is that because we are using uh, IDs that are generated by the compiler, uh, SDN apps having to directly uh, materialize these messages is going to be difficult. Second, the values themselves are encoded as uh, you know, byte, a byte array, and what that means is that we lose a bit of type safety in doing so. Uh, one other concern is about versioning as the P4 program itself evolves. So imagine at version two, we no longer want it to match on ethernet source address, and we therefore remove it from the match fields. Um, we then go ahead and rebuild all our applications and tools. Now also imagine that we have some version one uh, PI proto traces lying around and we now want to analyze them. Well, we would no longer be able to do that very easily if we use the latest uh, log analysis tool uh, because it would now not be able to recognize the field ID associated with uh, the, the match field that we just removed. So you'd have to build uh, some sophisticated versioning control uh, into your apps and all the tools that you would like to use. Um, at this point, I would like to hand over to Summer to talk about a proposal to address these concerns. So, thank you, Vakar. Um, so in order to address these three issues, readability, type safety, and uh, evolution of the P4 program, we are proposing a program-dependent API that we want to expose between the SDN apps and the controller front-end. So the RPC mechanism is still there, uh, but essentially the controller front-end is exposing a program-dependent service which can be used by SDN apps. Uh, we still use protocol buffers uh, to define the schema for these uh, program-dependent API, uh, just like we do for the PI API. But the difference is now that, as the name implies, as your P4 program evolves and changes, this schema and the API also changes with it. Uh, of course, once, you, once the schema changes and the SDN apps write flow entries using this schema, eventually they would have to be translated into the PI messages uh, to be fed to the switch over the P4 runtime, uh, using the P4 runtime interface. And for that, we also auto-generate, or we propose to auto-generate a library to translate from uh, PD messages to PI messages, as well as on the way back, if the SDN app is trying to read a flow entry from the switch, it's going to, uh, the controller front end is going to get a PI message from the switch, and then that would have to be translated back to a PD message. So let's look at the tool chain. So the right-hand side uh, tool chain of uh, generating the IR, the P4C backend, uh, that is being fed to the P4C backend and so on is what we already saw earlier. On the left-hand side is the tool chain that is associated with the generation of these PD uh, API. So as Vakar already mentioned, we have the P4Info that is generated from the P4C frontend. And we are proposing a new tool called PDGen, which is essentially generating two things. On the left-hand side, the schema for the program-dependent uh, API and the PD to PI translation library that I talked about earlier. Uh, on the bottom, this is familiar. So we have SDN apps that are now going to talk uh, using RPC PD protos. And then the controller front-end is going to translate those PD protos into PI protos and then program the switch, and similarly on the way back. Uh, the uh, difference between PI and PD, uh, the, some of the important differences are first, we, in the PD world, we refer to the P4 tables by name as opposed to IDs. So the schema, of course, changes. We also have very strict typing of match fields. So earlier, what you saw in the, in the PI uh, materialized protos that we had bytes uh, being uh, used in order to refer to different uh, values. Now we'll have strict types associated with them. What are the PD benefits? And we'll uh, see these benefits as we go through some examples. Uh, first, it gives you a lot better readability in, on the app side, right? and also gives you type safety. So we are using type protos as opposed to bytes. Uh, it gives you tooling friendliness, because when you analyze the logs of uh, these RPC messages, then you can actually see which tables were being written to and so on. And you can analyze those logs better. And finally, uh, Bakar earlier highlighted the problem with versioning. If you remove, for instance, uh, a match field in your 
key in your PFOA program, uh, you would have problems with, uh, with version control, and we'll see how to address those using the type proto characteristics. So in order to have this PDGen tool, we need to uh, define an encoding from the PFOA program to the PD protos. Uh, the PD protos are generated for all table entries, actions, and action profile members. And we do type conversion. So the P4 bit vectors are converted to uh, prototypes. And prototypes are, uh, in this particular case, they're based on uh, uints. Uh, if you have um, fields that are smaller, uh, if you have fields that are smaller than uh, 64 bits, then we are able to use uint types. But if they are larger, for instance, in the case of IPv6 addresses, then you'd uh, have to resort to bytes. And then the translation library performs the runtime bit width, uh, runtime validation of the bit width. So here is an example. So for instance, you have a field, let's say like ether type, which is 16 bits. Uh, the prototype that you'd used for an exact match on that field would be a uint 32. And if you wanted to do a ternary match, then you define a ternary 32, which has the mask and the value. And similarly, LPM would have the value and the prefix length. Now, if uh, I wanted to do a match on ether type, and uh, when creating the flow entry, uh, the SDN app writes something that is beyond the scope of the 16 bits, then the uh, translation API at runtime is going to catch this error. So that way you'll have uh, type safety as well. So let's look at an example of, uh, you know, of this <laughs> PD proto schema. On the left-hand side is the familiar uh, VRF classifier example that Pakar already showed. On the right-hand side, we have uh, the schema. So you'll see here that corresponding to the table name, we have a new message type. So message essentially defines a new type in the proto world. And within that VRF classifier table entry type, we have a match and an action uh, type as well. And this line here, match, match equal to one, it, it's instantiates, uh, it, it shows that there is uh, a variable of a type match within this table entry structure, right? And that uh, structure consists of these three um, uh, fields right? corresponding to the types of the matches that you had here. So here you're doing an exact match, so you want to send just one uint 32. Here you want to do a ternary match, so you want to send the mask as well as the value. Now, once we have this schema defined, how are we going to go about, how is the SDN app going to use the schema to program a flow entry? So again, on the left-hand side is the schema that I just showed you. On the right-hand side is an example. So protobufs have uh, very nice associated tools that let you, from the schema, let you generate C++ APIs, or APIs in lots of different languages. Um, so this is an example of an SDN app code in C++ where we have a VRF, VRF classified table entry variable being declared. And then we create, uh, we obtain a match object for that entry and then populate that match object with the, the ether type and the ingress port values. And then we obtain the action object from table entry and then set uh, the, the action spec by defining the set VRF ID um, value here. Now, what about uh, program evolution? So earlier we saw the problem with uh, PI evolution. How do we solve that in, uh, in the PD world? So on the left-hand side, we have the, I've taken a snippet out of the table uh, VRF classifier. And here we see a key uh, with the match on the ethernet source address. And you'll notice here that we have a new tag, at tag two, and this tag is what determines the field value, field that is defined over here, right? the field ID that is defined on the proto side. Right? So let's say, going back to the same example, we, in version two, we decide that we do not want, in, in my VRF table, we do not want to match on the ethernet source address. Right? So how do I reflect that in my PD proto? So we do that by not removing, well, we will remove this particular match field from the key, but we want to add an annotation that marks that this particular match is not deprecated. Right? And that would allow us to create a deprecated match over here on the PD side. Mm -hmm. So what this essentially means 
is that an SDN app that was trying to populate a flow entry using this proto, right-hand side proto, does not need to be upgraded at the same time as the P4 program itself. Right? So you may upgrade the P4 program, the switch, your new switch may realize the, the P4 program, but the app itself doesn't need to be uh, upgraded at the same time. So we can stage the upgrades. The other good thing that this gives you is that any logs that you see uh, from version one can now be processed by version two tools right? because the, this particular entry did not go away from my PD proto. And finally, let's say after a few months and you are no longer interested in, um, in seeing this field anymore and that you, you're not, no longer interested in seeing the old logs anymore or analyzing them, you can simply remove it and then you can reserve this particular tag uh, by annotating the table with the reserve tag annotation. And that would lead to a reserve two. So this, uh, this number two is not going to be used by any other field. So to conclude, um, we saw the PI interface between the controller front end and the switch, and it supports uh, field reconfigurability and easier vendor adop adoption, as Vakar already mentioned. And we propose a new PD interface between the SDN apps and the controller front end, which allows for type safety, for tooling friendliness, and also for uh, better versioning. And on top of that, we are also supporting this with a tool chain uh, using protocol buffers, using the autom automatic generation of the PD proto schema, as well as the automatic generation of the translation library between PD and PI. Okay. And I'm happy to take any questions now. question, if you jump back to the slide with version one, version two, version n, um, so what happens behaviorally in version two if a, if a controller app is sending a message with that oh, field that's so been deprecated? Yeah, so that's a good question. So behaviorally, that would be rejected by the switch. So if the switch has already been uh, upgraded to version two, then the, the flow entry message would be, would be rejected, but at least your app is still going to build, right? So 